Last week, I talked about how Islam advocates slavery, which means it approves of slavery and makes regulations to it in its fundamental scriptures. Now I want to go in Islam's history with slavery. That history is very big, to say the least, so I can obviously not cover everything. But I want to make you familiar with how the Islamic world was widely involved in slavery, and was mainly the major party to run it. Let's go back in history and have a look at one of the biggest slave trades. According to historians and even fundamental Islamic scriptures, slavery was quite common in Arabia in Muhammad's time, so that Muhammad, the prophet himself, had dozens of male and female slaves and actively traded slaves, or captured prisoners of war and generously distributed them as slaves to his warriors, because Muhammad was a very generous man, no offense. Islam didn't end slavery, although it had the power to do so. Instead, Islam adopted slavery and regulated it. When Arabs started conquering their way to Africa, the importing of slaves from Africa increased gradually, and when Muslims conquered significant parts of the eastern coast of Africa, they started actively assimilating slavery as an important part of their economic system. Historians place the beginning of the Arab slave trade to the 7th and 8th centuries, seven centuries before the Atlantic slave trade, although practically it began much earlier and was, as far as we can see, always there. The slave trade expanded greatly throughout the next thousand years and involved not only black African slaves, but also Europeans, especially Southern Europeans and Indians to some extent. Later, it was also not only the Arab slave trade, but a large network of different nations buying and selling slaves. There weren't many Arabs among slaves, but many Arab women were enslaved and usually sold to other Muslim nations in North Africa. Women were in general a big part of the slave trade, because Islam has a very popular form of sex slavery. The end of the slave trade was somewhere in the 20th century. The Islamic world was the last to officially abolish slavery. The slave trade lasted around 1200 to 1300 years or more. The name Arab slave trade is also disputed. Calling it Arab slave trade seems misleading to some, because parties involved were far more than just Arabs. We could also call it bluntly the Islamic or Muslim slave trade, or more generally the Eastern slave trade. The main victims of the slave trade were black Africans, also called Zanj. Zanj means basically blacks, and was used by Arabs and later by other Muslims to refer to dark-skinned Africans to the south. Arab views on black Africans were, as we can see in history, not very bright. And Muhammad's language, Muhammad himself, makes that even additionally clear. In a hadith, he tells his companions to respect everyone who rules over them, no matter from what group he is, and then goes on and says, even if he was an Ethiopian black slave whose head looks like a raisin. <laughs> Come on, Muhammad, this is so childish. Another notable record by a Muslim comes from a Tunisian Arab called Ibn Khaldun, whose work Muqaddimah is widely regarded as forerunner of modern historiography and sociology. It might be a forerunner, but it's certainly not sweet. In his book, Ibn Khaldun describes sub-Saharan Africans as natural slaves and says the Negro nations are, as a rule, submissive to slavery because Negroes have little that is human and possess attributes that are quite similar to those of dumb animals. It is important to note that Ibn Khaldun is seen as important part of what people call the Golden Age of Islam. If you are not disgusted yet, let's go on. As explained in the last episode, Islam doesn't allow the enslavement of Muslims, and therefore the main target of slavery were non-Muslims, and the easiest target were black Africans who were even more underdeveloped than Arabs, which means something. Historical reports show that slavery was an important part of the Islamic hegemony as early as in the Rashidun Caliphate, more notably in the Umayyad Caliphate, and more harshly in the Abbasid Caliphate. The first big international agreement to trade slaves was made during the Rashidun Caliphate under Umar's reign, who was the second caliph and a very respected figure in Islam. When the Rashidun Caliphate conquered Egypt and considered conquering the region to the south, but was defeated in a battle, the Muslims realized that conquering the region would be too difficult for that time, so they persuaded the Christian kingdom of Makuria with an agreement called Bakht instead. 
According to that agreement, Arabs wouldn't attack Makuria and Makuria wouldn't attack the Muslims, but Makuria had to send 360 high quality slaves to the new Muslim Egypt every year. This agreement was criticized by some Islamic scholars, not because it's a violation of human dignity, <laughs> what are you thinking, but because it was an obstacle to the expansion of Islam, since the Muslims had a treaty with Makuria now and couldn't invade it in future. The agreement lasted over 600 years and continued under all the other caliphates that ruled Egypt. It was clearly approved of by the Islamic powers. But the use of slaves was not limited to that region. They were also sent in big numbers to eastern lands, through India, even to Southeast Asia and China. Speaking of India, the Umayyad Caliphate enslaved thousands of Indian people during its campaigns in India and made big contributions to expanding the demographic diversity and numbers of slaves. Slaves were also under very harsh conditions under the Umayyads, because the Umayyad Caliphate had a hierarchical worldview of Arab supremacy, placing even non-Arab Muslims below Arabs. You can only imagine how non-Muslims and slaves were treated. It was also the Umayyad Caliphate and Islam that brought major slavery to India. Before it was there, but slavery was not big in India. Islam brought it there. The Umayyads also enslaved Europeans and enabled the enslavement of South Europeans under future Muslim rulers in North Africa and Spain, or Iberia. Slaves were captured from Italy, southern France, the Iberian Peninsula, and later even at coastlines of the British Isles, Iceland, and other places. The Umayyads also openly discouraged the conversion of so-called slave nations to Islam because actively converting them would be an obstacle to enslaving them, and slaves becoming Muslims would give them more rights to free themselves from slavery, which would damage the cause. The Abbasids imported big numbers of slaves as military forces or as cheap labor. We can even see this in a historical rebellion called the Zanj Rebellion, the rebellion of black people led by an unknown man called Ali ibn Muhammad, who gathered myriads of black slaves, it was one of the largest, most destructive rebellions in the region ever. The historical background and circumstances of the rebellion show us that slaves were in extremely poor and harsh conditions under the Islamic Caliphate and were very often mistreated by society and their masters. The rebellion was one of many rebellions under the Abbasid Caliphate, but since slaves and blacks were treated poorly, very high numbers of slaves and other black people joined this rebellion. It was eventually crushed by the Abbasid forces and ended with a death toll that is estimated to be between more than 500,000 to 2.5 million. This rebellion didn't end slavery, it only weakened the Abbasid Caliphate temporarily. In the following centuries, slavery was always upheld and a big part of the Abbasid Caliphate's social structure. The Turkish Seljuks and the Ottoman Empire, or Caliphate, also maintained slavery, although Seljuks were formerly slaves themselves. The same was the case under the Mamluk Sultanate in Egypt. Mamluk means basically slave. The Mamluk rulers were former slaves, but they maintained slavery widely under their own rule, because slavery was a big part of Islamic society, it couldn't just be dismissed. Especially the Ottoman Empire used slavery widely, but in the empire, slaves were rather domestic servants instead of labor force. What the Ottoman Empire also did was to expand the demographics of slavery further. Raiding Europeans and Caucasians and enslaving captured people became a common practice. Barbary pirates under the Ottomans made big raids and captured people from coastlines to bring them back as slaves. Especially children and women that were captured were very valuable. Because as noted in history, unlike in the European Atlantic slave trade, in the Islamic slave trade, female slaves were in high demand and children in even higher demands. You have surely heard of famous Ottoman harems. Those harems were full of sex slaves. Sex slavery was very common in the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire had the biggest harems. Black slaves in the Ottoman Empire served in harems, while white slaves were in administrative positions. Ottomans also captured young Christian boys and raised them with Islamic Ottoman indoctrination and turned them into a feared class of soldiers, the Janissaries.
Janissaries were the elite military force of the Ottoman Empire. They were children of Christians, kidnapped by the Ottoman Empire or taken from families that were unable to pay the jizya tax, forcibly raised under Islam, forbidden to create families, and subjected to absolute loyalty to the Ottoman government. Slavery was so big in the Ottoman Empire that one-fifth of the population in 1609 were slaves. But there is more to all the slaves, especially under the Ottomans. You almost thought I wasn't going to mention it, right? Another very big difference between the European Atlantic slave trade and the Islamic one was castration. The Ottoman Empire didn't want to put up with sexually active men working for them in their own homes, which is why most slaves were castrated from childhood. But this is not a practice that belonged only to the Ottoman Empire. That practice came into the Ottoman Empire from Islamic rule and Arabs. Even in early Islamic history, imported slaves were mostly castrated, who underwent this barbaric practice in their childhood, so they could serve as eunuchs and wouldn't need sexual goals and trouble. To be fair, this practice was not started by the Muslims, but the Muslim world was the biggest customer of castrated black or white slaves. They were in such high demand that everyone paid more for a castrated slave, which increased the castration of slaves before their import. Therefore, the Islamic world started actively castrating captured slaves as well, since sexual segregation is very important in Islam, and men without penises apparently came handy. It is reported that the Abbasid Caliphate had 7,000 black and 4,000 white castrated slaves only serving the palace in the 10th century. And it is estimated that the majority of slaves in the entire Arab slave trade for over 13 centuries were castrated, meaning they had their testicles and penis completely removed which was a dangerous practice. It is reported that most slaves died during castration, but castrated slaves were so valuable that the masters of the Islamic world and their suppliers never stopped this practice until the 20th century. Slavery went on wherever Islam arrived. It was part of the economic system in North Africa, the Middle East, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, and widely in Asia. And the Islamic world abolished slavery after everyone else, only under heavy pressure of the West. Slavery even boomed once again in the Islamic world when Europe abandoned slavery in the 19th century. And the enslavement of Africans declined only when Europeans colonized and scrambled Africa again in the 19th century. In fact, it is recorded that the Ottoman Empire still sold masses of slaves in the 20th century, before it collapsed. In countries like Yemen, Saudi Arabia or Qatar, it was still widely ongoing until half a century ago. In Sudan and Mauritania, it was going on for much longer. In fact, the last country to officially abolish slavery was Mauritania in 1981, only 37 years ago. And unofficially, it is still ongoing in Mauritania, in Sudan. There have been reports of slaves being sold through open auctions in Libya, only years ago. And there are experienced reports of slaves from the Gulf countries. Mauritania was even so arbitrary that it criminalized slavery only in 2007, 11 years ago. Another important detail to mention is that the infamous European Atlantic slave trade was inspired by slavery that was already going on in Africa and Asia. And Muslim nations were directly involved in the Atlantic slave trade. It is proven that Muslim nations contributed greatly to the Atlantic slave trade, and so did sub-Saharan African nations. Why wouldn't they? The Europeans came as amateurs, while the Islamic world were already masters of slavery. Yet we are only talking about Europeans and slavery. As we can see, slavery was a very big part of society and economy in the Islamic world throughout history. It was there before the West, and it ended after the West, due to Western pressure. And partially it is still ongoing. It was also more fatal than the Atlantic slave trade, harsher against women and children, and racism was a very, very strong factor in it. So was religious supremacy, Islamic supremacy. It is unbelievable that we are not talking about this today, when the Islamic world should come together, face its past, admit everything, and apologize for the atrocities. After all of this, how can anyone come and say that the Islamic history was peaceful and equal for everyone? 
After all of this, think about groups like the Nation of Islam that advocated conversion to Islam because the evil white Christian men enslaved them. Movements advocating such ideas were either deceitful or completely ignorant about their history. This was a rather short but comprehensive summary of the history of slavery in the Muslim world. I can't possibly talk about everything, because I would be taking too much of your time. But I would encourage everyone to research this and to work on this history, so that we can let more and more people know about these atrocities committed by a very big religious group that has ironically recently started to describe its religion as peaceful. If you think that a religion that advocates slavery is peaceful, then go ahead and call it so. If you think mainly castrated black men traded on open squares in the capitals of big empires is an example of peace, go ahead and call it so. I will certainly not agree with that, and I will be here to give you more and more reasons why I don't agree with that. Islam is not a religion of peace, and never has been and never will be. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please don't forget to like, to subscribe, and to share. My videos are not monetized, so you can watch everything without any ads. If you want to support me and my cause, you can support me on Patreon. The link is below in the description. You can also choose to support me once through PayPal. Thank you so much for every kind of support. We'll see each other in another video. Have a nice day and stay away from Islam.